awkward not having the slides up, but I actually kind of prefer it because it's old school. It's the way I used to give presentations. Uh, really, this is about telephone entry systems, which hopefully most people are familiar with. If you've ever seen the keypads outside a building that you touch, it's just like a phone pad. Has anybody not seen a keypad like that outside a door? Has anybody not seen? <laughs> All right, so the question is really, is there anyone not familiar with the keypad entry system? Right? Everybody is. Okay, cool. So basically, I'm going to go through four things here. I'm going to do an introduction. We're going to go over an overview of the systems I'm talking about, details. Uh, then we'll talk about the exploits that I found, many of which are public, and I'll talk about my philosophy of the exploits as well, and then opportunities. Oh, nice. Uh, okay. Hold one second. This may or may not work. That's way less fun. I was going to describe to you some cool stuff. Does this work? No, this is fine. Okay, so my name is Davi Ottenheimer. It's just D-A-V-I. Uh, this is my 16th year in information security, so I'm pretty happy with it. It's what I like to do. And last year I went full-time independent, so I run a company called Flying Penguin. And it's been going pretty well. In fact, I'm probably going to start hiring here pretty soon. I'm kind of a contrarian. I think that's how I got into this, and I think I, I don't know, this is probably a bad thing to say, but I've been using Macintosh for 21 years now, and I just, this year I went totally Apple free. That was like my big thing. So, <laughs> so I, just, I just got rid of it all, but that's kind of my philosophy. Like the hard road is sometimes the more interesting and fun road, so uh, it's not exactly how I got into this particular case, but I'll talk about that later. One of the things I do with big companies is talk about security versus compliance. People ask me all the time what's the difference, and I just want to make this one point because I think it's pretty simple. Really, security is personal. Like, if you feel secure or you have a security gauge, that's your decision. But every time you talk about compliance, you talk about it in terms of everyone else. So it's like at least two people or more. So two people have an idea of security, they get together, that's compliance because they're agreeing with one another. And that's what I'm going to talk about here because in terms of locks, you know, at least buildings I lived in, I would sit inside and think there's something on the front door that protects me from people getting in, and I have a sense of compliance. It's not just security. I haven't gone down and tested it myself. I believe that there's some degree of compliance to a standard or a code of what key locks should provide. And I know these conferences are, I mean, I've seen like key lock presentations every single time I go to a hacker conference for the past however many years, and I know it's popular, and I thought, no one ever talks about these keypad systems. At least I haven't seen one, so I thought, what the heck? The title is Easy Hacks for a reason. These are really simple hacks, and I'll talk about that in terms of compliance, not so much in terms of security, but you could go either way. So the risk calculations, I just bring that up because I think a lot of this is risk. Like, it depends where you live, but I, I live in a neighborhood that actually is pretty dangerous. It gets broken into a lot, surprisingly. I, I actually didn't think that would be the case. I thought it was pretty safe, but as I found out, I started monitoring, I noticed that a lot of stuff was getting broken into, and that's kind of how I got involved in this. Was, Somebody asked me, a manager asked me to take a look at some of these systems. So when I look at risk, I look at the assets that are protected. In this case, it would be somebody's apartment or somebody's business. The vulnerabilities, right, which most people don't know. Like, you walk up to a building and you kind of look at those keypad systems, but you might not actually test them or you might not be familiar with them. Maybe you haven't installed them. That seems to be the way most people figure out the vulnerabilities, is they install one themselves and then immediately they go, whoa, <laughs> this is how these things are built? And then the threats, that's sort of what I talked about a little bit. You know, it's hard to gauge threats in neighborhoods. Like, you can look at certain signs, graffiti is one. There's a whole criminal, like, study of this, right? Cr criminal behavior and the philosophy of what begets crime. But if you look at certain signs and things in the neighborhood, you can sort of put two and two together. The more keypad entry systems you see, probably the more crime that's been in that neighborhood. Which is ironic when we get to the re rest of this presentation, when you see what's really going on. And then I have to do my little spiel about white versus black, because I consider myself totally white hat. I don't really do a lot of black hat. And the difference for me is purely authorization. So if somebody asks me to do something, I will. But I won't initiate an attack on a system unless someone said, would you please test this? And that's entirely what this presentation is about. So I do a lot of work with big companies, and they ask me to do tests and penetration testing. I've done it for a long time. But in this particular case, I was specifically asked to look at this box. I probably wouldn't have done it otherwise. I just would have been really mad and known what was going on. But in this case, they said, can you look it inside? And then finally, there's this whole exploit versus like, oh my god, it's an exploit. And for me, an exploit is just a flaw. And we find them all the time. You know, like a tire goes flat, 
it's maybe an exploit, right? It's maybe something you should know about. Somebody's done something to you. Maybe it's something you should have considered when you bought the tire. Uh, it, it always reminds me of this time I did a penetration test in a, in a company that was, it was a really big company, and they were bringing in some really big names. So, for example, you might say it was like Apple and IBM or Microsoft and IBM were using this hosted facility. And we did some testing where we went in to see if they couldn't see each other's data. And right away, we could see, you know, A could see B, B could see A. And I was working with a guy who, I don't know how he got into security, but he used to be a tow truck driver. And I was talking to him about his life, and he was like a really cool guy. But as soon as we found this, and I said, Look at this, it's ridiculous. You know, they can see into each other's stuff. He literally stood up, threw his arms up, and went running down the hall like, exploit, exploit. And like he told everybody, you know, your system's totally screwed, you're totally hacked, you know. And I try to avoid that, like sensationalization. But in this case, I really, I'm just trying to get the word out because like I say, I've seen a lot of the physical key lock breaking and I haven't seen a lot of the keypad stuff discussed. Okay, so enough of that stuff. The overview really is going to be about telephone entry systems, and it's about remote entry. So you want to let somebody in, and they're far away, and you want to use the telephone system because it has the keypad already designed, and maybe you live in a multi-unit dwelling, so it's convenient to have lots of people allow multiple people in. So that's really the whole concept here. And you see there an actual diagram that I pulled off of one of the vendor sites, which shows you what you're getting yourself into when you buy one of these things. You have a display. You have that postal lock, there's a speaker so they can hear you talking, right? This should all be familiar. And there's an enclosure lock. Now, I think before I did this research, research loosely termed, I think before I did this, I would have looked at this and thought, yeah, it's a box, right? There's a key, it's pretty familiar stuff. It even looks like a safe deposit box. They're used all the time. But after I went through the stuff I did and I look at this, I just go, oh my God, that's what's protecting me? So hopefully that's the reaction you'll get at the end of this presentation. That's really what I'm looking for. And the way it usually works is you have a list of names that have been dialed, that have been programmed in. Somebody puts in the dial pad code for the name. So 1234 might be your name code. So 1234 answers, and then they press a key. And that key is really a number. So they press a six or a nine. Typically, I found that they don't change very often. And they're not very unique. So you can already start to see the problems because that's it for the key to be. The key itself is a six or a nine tone that unlocks the door. And there are lots of them out there. I did not test multiple units. It did occur to me to start a campaign where I would go around the city and look at every single keypad system, but again, I wasn't authorized to do that, so I have not done that. I would recommend somebody get authorized to do that and do a study. I would really like to see the results, but there are a lot of different systems made by a lot of different vendors. This one focuses on just the one that I was asked to look at, and that's Centex, who I think is owned by Chamberlain. I haven't looked into it that in that much detail. I did find from their advertisements, the marketing literature, they say they're committed to safety and reliability. Of course, you're going to say that if you sell locks. And they're engineered with quality machine work and rugged construction, of course, and again, marketing. Very rugged construction. That's key when we get to the end of this presentation. And then they say they have a partnership network of trained service technicians. This also is a key because I find a lot of these devices are sold from a vendor who doesn't really stand up to them or service them or stand up to them as a company once they're in the field. In other words, they deploy them, but they rely on locksmiths and other people to basically implement them and take care of them and maintain them. And I'll talk about that later, but you can imagine already, you know, what happens. It's a similar situation in locks, right? You buy a lock from some guy, he doesn't make the lock, he just puts it in. But those guys know a lot about how to break the locks. People that put these things in, they study them. The same thing's happening in this field as well. So, oops, overview. Well, overview, it would be the Centex Telephone Entry System Spectrum DI that I'm looking at. DI is for the di directory insert. So on the right side, there's a piece of paper that goes inside. And this is a $1,500, roughly, it can be more or less, device that someone would buy for their front door. Now, from a security perspective, unless you realize that you have to open this every time and put this piece of paper in, uh, you might not think, well, what's el what else is inside that box? In fact, from a security perspective, as a designer, you might say, I want to make sure you can just put that piece of paper in and lock it and take it out without affecting the internals of the box. So again, Looking at this at face value, you might assume that someone's going to design it in a way that would be secure, when in reality, you have to open the entire box to put that piece of paper in. And that's the difference between a directory insert and a non-directory insert. The convenience they've just added completely exposes the inside of the box. So that's sort of what we're talking about. Again, with the overview, the Spectrum guys, they, they market this as durable and vandal resistant. They're talking about this specific box now. The, the box that it comes in is a vandal resistant box, and it uses an existing telephone network so you're keying it into existing wires. You don't have to rewire. They're basically trying to save you money. And that's why they say you can save thousands of dollars by putting this system into your 
into your environment. So the bottom line there is they're trying to say, spend $1,500 because think of how much money you'll save on implementation. What they're not saying is this thing is, if you boil it down, you look at these three, what they're not really saying is we'll stand behind our product if someone breaks into it, right? So going back to the keypad and how it works, I, was, I would assume a lot of people at this conference or maybe everybody is familiar with the uh, DTMF, which is just, right, that's a 2600 concept. So you push the button and it gives a tone and the tones are based on two sounds, right? So each key that you press on these door pieces or on the, on the keypad when you're at the door is going to make a tone and the tone is two combined frequencies which you can obviously replicate. So in the old system or the way exchanges used to work is they would take those tones and then they'd convert to binary and then they could do all sorts of computer things with it. But in the, the sense that these are still analog, there's no real computer back there, they're just moving the tones around. And so I'll jump right into the first exploit. Obviously you can replicate the tone. So my first thought on this actually was, well, that wouldn't work because you'd have to dial someone's number. But then I realized you just press the, the pound button and it gives you a dial tone. So it's listening. And then you press the tone and it lets you in. It's pretty awesome. So <laughs> it doesn't always work. Like only certain systems are like this apparently. But and I, I won't go into too much detail about what worked for me and what didn't work. But I have found these exploits are definitely worth testing. I would say that. So the correct frequency is all you have to do to mimic a key press and you can get the door to open. Obviously, in the case where you had to dial somebody, they would have to say, you know, oh, I answered, and then you could press a tone. But if you can get to the point where, again, from a security design perspective, you can get to the point where it's giving you the same interface as they've given you, and you put that tone in, which is very easy to play back, especially with today's phones, you're in. And there are charts all over the place that tell you exactly which tones are which keys. It's not like it's, this is secret stuff. Okay, so exploit two has been widely discussed on the web. I really don't feel bad about talking about this, but I still find people don't know it, so I thought I'd share anyway. That is the vendor defaults, right? You go into these boxes and a lot of apartment managers or building managers aren't really savvy or don't care about configuring these things. They put it in and they say, look, we're secure, when in reality they haven't changed the default password, which is all zeros. And so if you walk up to a box, this is a mini key exploit in particular, if you walk up to this box, this is what was discussed widely on the web. So you walk up to a box, you press star three times, you press the password, which is usually zeros, and then 99 pound is the command to get you in. So 99 pound after you've put in the password opens the doors. A lot of people don't realize that there's all these sequence codes. You can program in multiple passwords. So some of them have features that allow you to have key codes. You don't even need your key to the building anymore because you can start punching in the key codes to get in the building. Usually they're not set up that way. Usually they're set up or they should be set up so that one person has a password that's used to configure the system and then they lock it away securely. In fact, there's a way that you can verify the password has been entered properly because if you screw it up, you can't get back in the system and you have to reset it, which I'll, you know, which I'll show you here is just star, 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 two, zero, one, zero, one, zero. You know, you can just go and reset the box too if you want. Some of them allow you to <laughs> reset it to factory defaults and you're like, oh, I bet the password's zero, 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 zero. <laughs> and then I can open the door. So there are definitely some strange flaws in how easy it is to program these. The, the programming interface actually is, is super, super simple. And this was probably really cool like in the early 80s or maybe even the late 70s. But in today's technology, like you can imagine the chips you could put in, the things you could do, the interface, the programming you could do with these things. Even like with a touch screen that you could scroll, put a fingerprint on. Anyway, we get to the, the third exploit. And that's kind of based on the second one, right? So they're so easy to program. They're so easy to get into a programming mode that you can go in and start messing around with them. And if you open them up, there's actually a program button on a lot of them. So that's pretty cool. You push the program button and then you can just start working on them. Uh, there's also a keypad option. So if you want to go into program mode, which you already saw, it was star, 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 and then six zeros. Um, a lot of this stuff, honestly, I pulled right out of the instruction guide, which you can download anywhere, right? You just go, I want to see a syntax, and I want to see this model, and I want to see how to install it, and then it says, here's the password, and here's the program mode, and here's the network, or here's the diagram inside, the circuit board, and how it works, which I'll show you later. Uh, so there's also an exit option, so you don't want to stay, they, they warn you, don't stay in program mode, because somebody might use it, but you're like, you know, <laughs> maybe I wasn't supposed to use it in the first place. And so zero, zero, star, and it has a timeout too, so it'll knock you out after 60 seconds or something. Uh, here you see the 10 is to verify your password, because if you do go and hack one of these and take it over, you probably want to make sure you get your password right before you disconnect, or it might set it back to the original. Uh, another interesting thing, the feature set, I wanted to show the feature set for these boxes because it's so long. It's like amazing the things that they really can do with all this analog uh, programming. Uh, the sort of, uh, this is just one example I thought would be interesting. So you can remotely control the firmware and every single sentence